Welcome to the Collaborative Podcast. I'm your host, Spencer Krause. Our guest today is Mike Oinsman. Mike is an editor with the WTWH Group, whose portfolio includes The Robot Report, The Mobile Robot Guide, and The Robot Business Review, all great publications that I've read and heard of. Uh, Mike is also a um, co-host of The Robot Business Review Podcast and the first podcast host we've had on. Mike, welcome to the show. Yeah. Well, thanks, Spencer. Thanks for inviting me to come on the show today. My pleasure. Yeah, we, we met at that Cascadia event in Pittsburgh yep. at the beginning of the month, and uh, I just thought it would be fun to uh, to talk to you. Big fan of your publications, and um, yeah, I kind of wanted to hear about, I guess, a little bit how the sausage was made there, because you know I've been reading that stuff uh, as long as I've been in the field, <laughs> so, so it's a privilege to be meeting you. Yeah, absolutely, and and I really had you know it's, it's uh, it was a great time in uh, in Pittsburgh. I really enjoyed myself. Um, coming out for the Cascadia event, and uh, I stayed there till Friday, so I nice. had some extra time to hang out and uh, got a chance to visit, uh, you know, a local company, and uh, it was it was a good time and experience Pittsburgh. That's awesome. What all did you do here, like while you were while you were in town? Um, well, besides the event, got got the chance to go out to uh, tour Carnegie Mellon, nice uh, university. So that was uh, fun. It's the first time I've ever been on campus. And it wasn't familiar at all with, you know, the, what the, the campus looked like. And that was actually organized as part of the Cascadia event, but had a chance to walk through, uh, I think they took us through a half dozen robotics labs. Nice. So you would have yeah. seen then the Field Robotics Center, probably the Planetary Robotics Lab. And then the other ones, I have no idea what they showed you. So what all did you get to see? Well, there was a, there was a variety of, of, and I don't remember the exact um, lab owner name, so I apologize that I, I don't remember that off the top of my head. But we saw one on materials and wearables. So there's a oh, very cool. interesting lab um, where they're where they're working on wearable robotics and and, and 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 material science. So that one was interesting. There was another one that was working on perception, human perception, and trying to uh, understand how humans and robots can interface with each other. Uh, you know, down the road. So uh, that was interesting. And then there was one other lab. Uh, the grad student was working on, you know, cutting uh, robots or robots that can cut vegetables. And he was, so he's working on all the algorithms on how to use utensils to cut to cut vegetables. Badass. That's really cool. Yeah. I, I think I saw something like that in the Field Robotics Center High Bay last time I was in there. So I feel like that might have been the one. Basement of Noel Simon Hall, maybe? Yeah, yeah, I was uh, down in the basement. Yeah. yeah, I spent a lot of late hours in there. Uh, Chuck Whitaker, really good friend and mentor. Um, he's uh, Red Whitaker's brother, but he's like a lot more uh, just down to earth and kind of just mm. a just a gentle, nice person. Um, which I'm not saying Red's not a nice guy, but uh, yeah. you know, he's got a reputation for being a bit of an arrogant bastard. <laughs> and so yeah, just different personality. So right? uh, Chuck is, uh, you know, I mean, I would give that guy a kidney if he asked me for one. I mean, he's pretty much taught me how to use a uh, vertical mill and a lot of other useful skills that have kind of stuck with me in my career. That's cool. And then, yeah, just lots of, there was one guy in there, Jim Picard, that, you know, could kind of tell when something was going to go wrong. So, you know, he's like, I don't like that you're using a mechanical relay. You know, <laughs> you like spot the failure mode before it happens. So that was kind of neat. Um, yeah, now there's a lot of great personalities in there. Um, interesting stuff. They were doing nuclear um, waste storage facility inspection robots a little bit ago, mm. which you never see in an academic lab. I mean, like, I, I think the stuff actually got sent to a, uh, you know, into the field, which is super neat. And it kind of presented a service problem because, you know, there's no way they're going to get these things back to look at them once they're right. hot, as it were. <laughs> so, right. Yeah, it's um, really a privilege to have been able to hang out in those labs. So You know what? I thought was amazing one of the things that impressed me was actually where they purposefully started the the tour there which was in the undergraduate robotics maker lab it's it's in the business school interesting i didn't i don't think i've seen that yet okay yeah it's it's fairly new so what they have done you know graduate students have robots to use for their research so um that's not an issue but for the undergraduates they've created this maker space and they have like they've got a pepper robot in there. They've got a bunch of other um, robots, uh, several UR robots. And it's just like oh, a cool. maker lab. Instead of having machine tools, it's a robotics lab and they can reserve 
the robot and come in and actually program it to do a project. And it could be either school related or it could just be some crazy idea that they have. That's awesome. Um, there's a drone cage in there. There's a motion capture stage. Um, and there's a bunch of smart appliances. That's pretty serious. <laughs> That's... Yeah. And so I, I thought, and I, what a what a great resource for undergraduates, you know, to either just come play if they want to have some, you know, play with some some of the robots that they certainly couldn't afford at that point in their life nice. um, to interface with. And then the other interesting thing is that it's right outside the elevator of the business school. So, so every this would be in the, in the Schwartz Center? Yes. Or? Okay, cool. Yeah. It's so that new building that's across from the rest of Right. That's awesome. The Morgan Center is in there as well. So every business student sees it every day as they come and go to class <laughs> and trying to, uh, you know, really bring the students together, um, you know, you know, between business and, and engineering to, to uh, I suppose, see, you know, some future relationships. That's really awesome. And I mean, definitely a good thing to be aware of as a business person, because it's a growing market for sure. Yeah. You know, lots of markets really under that umbrella. But I, um, yeah, no, I kind of wish that it had been there when I went to school there. Back in my day, um, the Carnegie Mellon Robotics Club was a pretty good resource for undergrads. Yeah. So um, I was actually an undergrad at University of Pittsburgh, but I found out um, maybe like two thirds of the way into my degree, uh, or like three quarters, whatever, like somewhere around there, that I think junior year, that you could cross register for free uh, to the student in one CMU course as a Pitt student every semester. So I got Howie Chose, it's in short of robotics, and I got John Dolan's mechatronic design. Hmm. Um, so that was really cool and, and great resources. But even before that, I found out about the CMU Robotics Club. And at one point, I was the only Pitt student registered, but I was leading two projects. Yeah. And so, I, I mean, I just I would spend all my free time there. I, I was a computer science student. And so I focused on the hardware side of robots for fun, yeah. you know, and, and I would be in the machine shop or at the electronics bench and right. kind of building out that those aspects. So, you know, it was just a tremendous resource and one I'm super grateful for. So I'm glad that they're sort of extending those offerings to the undergrads because, I mean, that really differentiates uh, that university from some of the, the other ones out there, I think. For sure, yeah. yeah. So where's home for you? I, uh, I should have checked your LinkedIn, but I, I'm... I live, in, I live in Northern California. Cool. Um, I, you know, I moved, I moved uh, to the Bay Area a long time ago to start my career, but left when I couldn't afford to buy a house in the Bay Area. That makes sense. Yeah, I was uh, talking to a buddy of mine uh, who just left NASA Ames for Google about the housing market in the Bay Area versus in Pittsburgh. And um, he was mentioning, I, I told him, I'm like, yeah, you can still get a decent house here in, in Lawrenceville for like under 400 grand. I said the hipster part of town because he doesn't know what Lawrenceville is. <laughs> He's like, you know, it's, yeah, it's like starting like 2 million around here. <laughs> right, yeah. So we, so we live up in the gold country where gold was discovered in California about an hour outside of Lake Tahoe. Oh, hmm. awesome. Unfortunately, it's fire country, so that that's what we have to live with up here is all the oh, wildfire. Sorry to hear that. But, you know, that's life living yeah, in sure. rural uh, forest interface. I do love the Bay Area. I uh, yep. took six trips in 2019 for work reasons, and, um, I mean, just some of the people I met through that I'm still friends with to this day, you know. Just the amount of mental horsepower, I think, in, like, one geographic region. I don't know if I've seen that parallel yeah. anywhere else. For sure. Yeah, so that's that's kind of neat. Um, you could even see it like, and this is going to sound bad, but on the dating apps, you know, which I mean, occasionally I'll open up when I'm traveling, you know, you're like, oh my God, another robotics engineer. <laughs> like, what the heck? <laughs> so, like, what are right. the odds of that? <laughs> so, it doesn't happen in Pittsburgh. So <laughs> that was kind of interesting. And then, um, I mean, some good resources. So obviously, Andrew's got Silicon Valley Robotics. Um, and then, I mean, some of the stuff companies are doing. So I guess Johnson & Johnson just acquired RS like a little bit ago. Um, I mean, that's old news at this point. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, I mean, what are some of the ones to watch, in your opinion, out in the Bay Area? Well, you know, there's a lot of interesting things going on in a variety of different market segments. Um, you know, unfortunately, with the the whole pandemic, I haven't had a chance to, to visit many folks um, in, uh, in the uh, live recently. So haven't had that chance to, to, to have any much serendipity 
with some of the the the, uh, the, the newest things, um, but um, I have to say that uh, you know one of the the areas that I'm starting to pay more attention to is agriculture, robotics, and so the the key there is that um, uh, you know there have been some interesting um, um, developments there. So Monarch Tractor is a is a Bay Area company. Oh, cool. Um, Based, at, you know, they're based over in Livermore in the wine making region uh, of, good of the place Bay Area. <laughs> yeah, and so um, you know they've they've built an all electric autonomous tractor, first of its kind. That's so really cool. Of, I've not seen anything like that. Yeah, sort of the Tesla of tractors, if you will. That's all autonomous. So that's an interesting um, development, and uh, you know. Um, same thing in ag. Um, John Deere has just acquired, you know, um, uh, a couple of, of interesting technologies recently that you know came out of the Bay Area. What kind uh, of stuff? Because I know they were an early mover on autonomous tractors, like even in the yeah. early two thousands. Yeah, but they acquired Blue River Technology and in, in, in a few other uh, companies as well. So, um, cool. You know that's happening, and then and then just again it's back in the mobile robot space, which is the space that I cover. You know, you've got a company like Bear Robotics, which is, you know, doing um, restaurant robot. That's a market I've been fascinated by for a long time. Yeah. When I was so, an undergrad in the CMU Robotics Club, we had projects, you know, involving, you know, food preparation automation. And mm -hmm. I mean, you know, we, did, we didn't really make a dent in it as students, but I mean, I, I, I'm interested. And so I'm kind of, I want to hear what's going on there. Uh, yeah. So, so you know, there, I think there, there's a lot of innovation happening there, and of course, same thing on the auto autonomous driving. Cruise is now, you know, running um, public trials in in San Francisco with their with their robo taxi. That's so cool. Uh, so that's one of the things that uh, you know I want to get down to San Francisco and take a ride in before you know before it's too late. So. Yeah, that'd be awesome. How do you get like on the list for something like that? Do you just have to kind of get lucky? Because I've heard when Uber was trialing in Pittsburgh, like occasionally if you called an Uber, you'd get an autonomous one, but it was it was very rare. Like people yeah. would brag about it if they got in one. <laughs> well, I, I've, I've got a little bit of an inside route as a press media person. So we're Steve, <laughs> Steve Crow and I are already working on, uh, um, you know, having a, our own private ride when we come out for the uh, Robo Business event in September. So. Nice. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, it, um, I have a buddy who's an engineer at Waymo and uh, mm -hmm. got married, I want to say, in either 2018 or 2019, I can't remember. But the, the car at the wedding that said just married was a, was a Waymo self-driving car. That's so that cool. Was cool. And I think they had a now um, from that French company, Alberine, yeah. I don't probably mispronounce it. But they, um, the the robot performed the vows for the wedding. So that's hilarious. Kind of a cool super nerd wedding. Yeah. Yeah, it sounds like a super robotic nerd wedding. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And I knew that guy when he was getting his PhD at CMU, um, and uh, I was uh, at Case Western at the time, and I just crashed on his couch. So, gone gone back quite a few years. It was cool to meet him out in the Bay Area and see what he was doing with Waymo. Yeah, so I, so I mean, those are some of the technologies. There's you know, there's still a bunch of things in, happening on the warehouse and logistics space. So you know, that's the other area of innovation. Yeah, for. I've been following Seagrid, Vecna, Berkshire Gray over there. FedEx seems to have some interesting offerings. I guess who have you been watching in that in that arena? Um, well, of course, companies like Locus are close to being, uh, you know, over a billion dollars wow. in value these days. So the first real unicorn from a mobile robot perspective, right? I would expect them to go public here in the next year or two as they really just go, you know, skyrocket to the top. But that's that's a um, Boston-based company. Um you know, in the in the Bay Area, there, there's a variety of companies that are, um, you know, working in in the pick and sorting, you know, space, and uh, that's been um, huge. Yeah, trying to do singulation in 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 the rest. So, um, yeah, you know, interesting things happening there as well. You know, the early innovators like Fetch now part of Zebra, so again, validation that you know. 
that technology was worthwhile to integrate into a bigger ecosystem. Yeah, that was interesting. Um, I'm going to blank on his name, but meeting the gentleman from Relay at the Cascadia event and talking to him. Yeah, Steve some, Cousin. Steve With Cousin, Relay. yeah, good dude. And like, I guess he was the CEO at Willow Garage where Melanie had worked before Fetch. Yeah. So just hearing some of that legacy and history there from him was, was really fascinating to me. Right. And seeing also that relay demo was really cool where they were able to actuate the elevator, but, or actuates by the wrong word, push buttons on an yeah. elevator with a robot autonomously. <laughs> so it's it the company formerly known as Savvy Oak, now known as Relay. So, right. I didn't realize that was Savvy Oak. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> My gosh. So they, they, they Thank you. Rebranded, <laughs> they rebranded and, and that was the, the coming out party at the at the event in Pittsburgh. Yeah, I remember he said they chose the new name the day before. I'm like, and you already got business cards? You must have the fastest printer in the world. He's like, we've been working out for a while. <laughs> ah, I see what you did there. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So what else is what else is it, are interesting things that you're seeing happening in robotics from your perspective? Sure. Um, so I guess the warehouse space is fascinating to me. We've already talked about that. I'm yeah. really interested in the medical robotics space. Mm. So I had mentioned um, that Johnson & Johnson acquisition, Oris, um, that's doing endoscopies. Mm. So that's kind of neat, which is any scope that enters the body through a natural orifice. So basically your mouth or your anus. But mm -hmm. you can do non-invasive um, inspection and surgery. And inspection is probably the wrong word. But diagnostic medicine and, and surgery that way. Um, and then... I think they're meant to have like a means for passing tools through it. And so that, you know, therein lies some of the surgery and biopsy options and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. um, Smith and Nephew Robotics here in Pittsburgh is doing some stuff with uh, knee replacement surgeries. They oh, have yeah. been for a while. I think they were springboarded off an acquisition of Blue Belt Technologies, which mm -hmm. um, my buddy Craig Markowitz was one of the co-founders on. Craig Markowitz, sorry, Craig, was one of the co-founders on. And... Um, it's just a really great team. Um, I'm, I'm friends with a bunch of them, and uh, I like those guys a lot. Um, yeah, I'm really fascinated by like the smart prosthetic space. Although I don't, I'll, admittedly, I the last time I was involved in that was 2017, so I don't know the current players that well. Mm. But I, I think that's a really cool market that I'm super interested in. So we um, had an interesting guest on the show today, um, Jeremiah Rob Robinson, who is the CEO and co-founder of a company called Psionic. Interesting, and, and they are making a um, a uh, it's an assistive device for folks who have like strokes or MS or um, um, oh man the the other the other conditions escaping me but it helps to make sure uh, uh, it's not quite a, a an exoskeleton but it stimulates the leg muscles to to operate in uh, in function with with so your cool. leg. It's almost like a tens unit that anticipates where you're going and like delivers yeah, exactly. stimulation and, 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 and um, um, you know helps to helps to you know rehabilitate and strengthen um, the leg and you know in case of a you know a um, stroke patient that's really cool it can be so, something they can wear all day and they can they can walk on their own that's awesome with, even though they may have lot permanently lost function yeah I'd imagine that's good for like nervous disorders but probably not for like actual muscular degeneration because you still need the muscle to function in order for that right. actuation to work right. so that's that's a really neat approach i've never seen that done before psionic so you said so, yeah with this it's a c-i-o-n-i-c -I -I -C, and uh psionic. <laughs> yeah he's gonna be uh on our our pod here in another two weeks probably two weeks from now we'll run that episode that's awesome yeah so tune in, tune this will be coming book. out around the same time so if you're listening Check out yeah. uh, the Robot Report podcast and, uh, yeah, Psionic. Come yeah. to watch. And, you know, it was really interesting. We just got back from the um, device talks and the Robot Summit in Boston a couple weeks ago. Oh, cool. And, uh, you know, that was the, that was all about, you know, um, sur surgical devices, medical devices, and uh, the sort of the overlap of robotics. And What did you see there that was interesting to you? Because, I, I mean, I really am into that market, and I feel like I don't, get out enough so. well admittedly i didn't have time to spend any time at all on the device talks <laughs> in the world because i was busy running the, the robot summit all good i know the feeling that's cool event. but uh, you know the, the show floor was sort of uh 
split between a bunch of medical device devices and device, you know, core components, right? But again, I walked it, but I didn't know what anything that about, I didn't know understand anything I was looking at, right? There was all these devices. <laughs> well, it gets so niche. I feel like with medical stuff, um, I recently started dating a nurse, and sometimes this person will talk about different like medical terminology. Like we were at lunch today, and they say like I I aspirated a um, a bit of vinegar, so we're eating a salad. I'm like mm. aspirate is that like when you like it's the medical term for it going down the wrong hole, idiot. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> oh, my bad. Yeah, thank you for teaching me something. I appreciate this. <laughs> so, there's such a, it's a whole universe. I mean, like, I, and I feel yeah. like I've been really fortunate in the orthopedic space because my dad is an ortho surgeon. So I've gotten a lot of free um, consulting on like human anatomy and like, especially of the skeletal structure yep. and um that's helped out with uh, a prosthetics project that my consulting company has worked on and a medical mm -hmm. robotics company uh, project we've worked on so we were able to land those contracts and deliver really good results partly because of that relationship and just you know being like hey tell me that anatomy again you know or, hey mm -hmm. when you're operating on a patient like what are the things that you're trying to like what are you struggling against when you're doing a knee replacement or you know when you're doing this or that you know so yeah, you know, so, uh, it, an interesting story about, uh, you were talking about active pro prosthetics. Um, one of my volunteer uh, going on over there? It's Pittsburgh, so a trolley is going by. Oh, really? That's <laughs> yeah, so we've got streetcars in 2022. Yeah. <laughs> so every time it runs by, you hear that sound, huh? Yeah, I, I try to get the audio engineer that, that works on the setup to, to get some noise cancellation going, but... Unfortunately, there's only so much you can do for that. So I think these two microphones cancel each other out as to those two. And, and like the stereo effect, I, this goes way over my head, but I'm told that like somehow like the Venn diagram of sound, like you can cancel out that stuff. But that backfired one time. We, we had uh, a lady on the first day, we had this four mic set up and she was kind of between those two mics. And so it, her voice got canceled out because of that effect. <laughs> So, you know, it's a work in progress. Um, That's interesting. There's another idea that I, I kind of pushed for, but the audio engineer has pushed back. So I don't know if it's feasible to implement. I might have just been, you know, a pipe dream on my part. But I was thinking if you could put a microphone near the road, you know, maybe you could monitor that sound like the way your iPhone, you know, looks for like um, ambient noise in your environment with that other mic they got. And then you could cancel out the differential between that and, you know, the actual studio mics. But haven't been able to do it yet so i don't know or you can build yourself a sand filled wall room there's another one <laughs> yeah yeah, yeah that, i mean exactly what's your background by the way you seem to have a really really deep technical knowledge and so i'm interested to hear kind of like obviously i mean the publications are impressive but you, you have you were like an engineer at some point or i was i started my career back in the late 80s at adept technology oh cool Adept was one of the first, um, it was the first direct drive robot. I first. actually just donated one of those to a uh, museum. Yeah? Yeah. They're in museum pieces now. Yeah, unfortunately. It was a but, CMU trash pick. It sat in a storage unit I had for a while, and then it was a museum notation. What, Adept one? Um, so it was direct drive. I think they had linkages that went through the arm, and then there were, like, universal linkages that broke that out. And then I think at the end, it looks like, I think there were miter gears on either side. And then the thing was controlled by two of those, but I'm not, hmm. I might be misremembering. No, no, no. I think that was it. Cause there was an IBM SCAR that had like all belt drive. Hmm. So I don't know is the short answer. But, yeah. But yeah, so I was, I, I started my career in depth, worked there till 2000 and, um, Worked in worked in, and I, you know, even though I'm a degreed engineer, I was always a, a, either an application engineer or moved my way into product management. Oh, cool! And so um, I was product manager there for a half dozen years, and then moved over into enterprise software in the Bay Area. Probably better so money. Went to work. Well, you know, I, I I said I wanted to be a software product manager at a software company, not a robot company. Imagine that. As I got tired of, <laughs> of just giving away the software with the with the metal. That so makes sense. I wanted to go experience what what it was like to be a, a software product manager. So 
spent 15 years in enterprise software product management, product marketing for a variety of companies like um, uh, Remedy Software, which was the first help desk software. So if anybody's ever worked at a company that used Remedy, it was the original help desk software. I've definitely been on the client side of that because I've seen that in yeah. a lot of emails from different companies over the years. Yeah. It was, it was very innovative, but uh, you know, um, so I got, I sort of stayed on in, in that IT software space for 15 years, help desk and, and uh, configuration management, asset management, um, ended up at HP. Oh, cool. Um, uh, and then got recruited to come back to Adept in 2015 to take over their uh, mobile robot business. That's all. I didn't know Adept had a mobile robot business. That's interesting. Adept was the, one of the original mobile robots before anybody else. Before, you know, even Willow Garage was still doing research robots. Adept was selling commercial. That's really uh, cool. Mobile, the original mobile robots company, which was acquired by Adept, was one of the first companies doing mobile robots. Which, so Adept, can you say what was, company that was? Just out of curiosity to understand the history. It was called the. the it was called the um, mobile robots. Um, in, up in New Hampshire. Oh, cool. So they, they had the original mobilerobots.com website. So That's awesome. <laughs> and Adept acquired that and commercialized it. And so I got recruited to come back and, and run the business there. But that was sort of the waning days of Adept. Adept was struggling in those days. And so we uh, ended up selling the company to Omron. That's how it became a part of Omron. And, uh, and it, it was at that point after the acquisition that I decided I had enough of uh, that sort of corporate tier job. And so I became a consultant. And oh, so cool. I started consulting, doing a bunch of product management, product marketing gigs, uh, working for helping some friends with their startups along the way there. And then ultimately started the mobile robot guide in 2018. Nice. Just to keep the, that knowledge going. And then... Uh, so I actually freelanced. I was writing for the Robotics Business Review occasionally, and speaking at the Robo Business, you know, every year, um, you know, as a mobile robot expert. And yeah. then ultimately, you know, WTWH bought all those assets, and and I eventually, uh, you know, sold the the publication to them a year ago and joined joined the ranks of the editor. So congratulations. <laughs> yeah. Thanks. It's an interesting spot, you know, having been on the sell side for, you know, 25 years in technical marketing and product management and, and all of that. Um, it's fun to be where I am now because everybody tells me their stories now. So it's, you know, before, you know, you, you, you certainly know everyone in the industry, you know, you know what they're doing. You, you try to do your best to figure out what they're doing. But where we sit now is in the press side of things, everybody tells you their story. So I just love, you know, storytelling and, and uh, being in the middle of it all. That's awesome. Yeah, I've really been enjoying that about making these podcasts is, I mean, obviously a small taste compared to someone like you that's been you know, spearheading, you know, this, this industry's publications. But I uh, just in the last year I've been doing these, it's been really fun to kind of be on the receiving side and have people like Jurgen Pedersen come in and just talk about starting yep. RE squared. You know, that's, you know, I don't know that he'd yeah. tell me that stuff if I wasn't recording a podcast. <laughs> right? Yeah. yeah. You're just, you're getting a chance to document all those stories, right? Well, that's it, right? I, I think you probably have a similar love affair with the industry where you, you want to, you're like, if, I, if only other people could hear about this, I'm sure they'd find it interesting. And so... Yeah, exactly. that's, that's at least where it came from for me. Right? Yeah, yeah and so now it's, it's you know, just trying to, the, the fun thing about working in it, with this team is that we've got Dan Kara, who comes from an analyst background. So uh, interesting. Dan, Dan looks at every story as a as sort of a research project. He's at, actually at ICRA this week. Cool. In Philadelphia. So yeah, I'm kinda, I found out about that way too late in the game to go, and I'm kind of jealous of all my colleagues who are attending. That seems like a great yeah. conference. So Dan's in his element this week at, at ICRO, you know, with all the research stuff. Um, you know, Steve is our, you know, Steve's a trained journalist, so Steve comes with the journalism background, so he's always looking for the scoop and always trying <laughs> to dig into the background story, so that's good. And I come from industry. So I come with the big, huge network of folks who I've worked with over the years and, 
you know, everybody that was with ADEPT in those early days in the 80s and 90s now is somewhere in industry. And that sort of predated the whole Will Garage crowd. So yeah, you've got, sounds like it. You've got the ADEPT network of, of oh, I'm sort of the OG. <laughs> of the Original industry. gangster for the listeners. <laughs> like, like, like Joe Campbell, who's the, you know, does marketing for uh, UR. He was my boss at ADEPT. And oh, cool. so... You know, Joe's an OG marketing. Talk about a game-changing company, too. Like, you are, I mean, yeah. I feel bad for Rethink that they weren't able to crack that uh, that omelet, as it were, that egg. But, I mean, you know, you are really drove it home in a beautiful way. So that was that was yeah. cool to see. Right. Yeah. So, and then I, so I, I always come at it, you know, try, trying to understand what's the, you know, the story behind the product that they're trying to launch. So, yeah. Cool. Yeah, I'm such a dork. I feel like I always fixate on the technology probably more than I should. So I'm like, oh, is that force feedback? You guys pushed out Series Elastic? Oh, that's awesome. That's a great way to do yeah. it. But I think I put people to sleep with that kind of talk. Yeah, well, or it depends on who your audience is, right? Yeah. If, if your audience is engineers, then, then that's good. If yeah, for your sure. your audience is entrepreneurs, maybe not. Who knows? <laughs> I think it's a combination. But for this podcast, at least, it seems to mostly be engineers. So yeah. it, it seems like um, whenever I show this to like a researcher or, or, you know, a clinician or like an engineer, I mean, those people are really attracted to it. But I think lay people, not so much like it, it, it's a little too in the weeds, probably for a general audience. Yeah. yeah so. I don't know. I originally did this to try to get some kind of career benefit. But at this point, it's just fun. And so yeah. <laughs> it's a secret way to hang out and have a drink and. And this, Learn something. And, and, we're, and we're, you know, the, the fun thing that I enjoy is being able to talk to the people that are making a difference in industry. Amen, brother. Right? Yeah. So who else have you talked to lately that's kind of, you know, like impressed you or kind of opened your mind in some way you weren't expecting? You know, one of, I think one of my favorite guests on the show in the last couple of months has been John Hirschdick. Cool. I, haven't, I don't know his work that well, to be honest. Well, John, you know, John um, uh, c created AutoCAD. Oh, wow. Okay. I do know his work. <laughs> yeah. Realize. John, That's awesome. John, John founded AutoCAD back in the day, sold it. And the then original he, OGs of CAD. Yeah. And then he started Onshape. Wow. Right. And then he sold Onshape to PTC. And now he's still on at PTC running the division. But And he has his own podcast as well. It's an amazing uh, podcast. He's an amazing storyteller. That's awesome. Amazing speaker. We had him uh, on stage with Steve uh, at the Boston event as well, and he entertained everybody with his stories. Sounds like a as hell of a well. turnout from a panel perspective, at least. Yeah. Uh, so, when I guess you know, not, not even a panel, I mean, I heard the hype. Like, I saw the LinkedIn posts from my colleagues. Like, it, it seems like a hell of a turnout all around. Yeah. <laughs> So, you know, when, you, when you're able to, to get the attention of folks like that, you know, this, the same thing, you know, with be, being a journalist, I, you know, I get a chance to, to talk to the C-level folks, everybody that's, you know, running all of the businesses now take my call, right? Yeah, that's and it, awesome. That was, that, that was my secret. So, you know, there's, that's one of the secrets about, I think, being a consultant when I, was consulting, doing marketing and product management consulting and trying to help folks, you know, with product launches and product portfolio and what have you, you know, to call up a uh, CEO and say, hey, you know, what's going on with your product portfolio? Is there anything I can do you do for you? They wouldn't take my call, right? Yeah, I've been there. <laughs> but uh, as a journalist, calling them up and saying, hey, I want to write a story about your company or about your career everybody likes to talk about themselves. Amen. And so, and so, you know, once I realized that, that I could get any, I could talk to them for an hour, I could start talking to them, get an hour on their schedule. Um, and in the midst of all of that, they're telling me all their problems, right? Yeah. They're telling me where they're, where they're being successful, where they're struggling. And then when it was all done, it's like, well, okay, we're going to write the story, but Oh, by the way, you know, you, you need a market study done. You need a white paper done. You need help with this project. Can I, can I, uh, can I help you with that? Yeah. Right. Now you've gotten to know the person. You've sort of garnered some respect. You've right. got a much better end. We've had guests on like that at this podcast, where 
you know, the next day. So I'm sure you've noticed, right? You'll do the interview and, and that'll be a great conversation. But like, at least for me, like the moment the cameras go off, like sometimes people will hang around for like another 45 minutes, half hour, you know, give her 45 plus or minus 15 is usually what it ends up being. But mm -hmm. that like the censorship all goes away. So people are a little more free to discuss. And that's when those kind of conversations. So exactly. you go, oh, yeah, yeah, our director of product will be calling you tomorrow. Oh, great. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks. That's, I was not expecting that, but I appreciate yeah. it. Now, that's changed a little bit now that I'm officially a press media, right? Because people are always a little cautious about uh, what they say to the media. That's interesting. I'm uh, talking to someone from NPR tomorrow, and I feel like that's kind of like in the back of my head. I'm like, you know, should I wash my mouth around this person? What do I, you know? And it's like, oh, she's just a person, you know? Like, it's, she's probably yeah. just normal. Like, I remember reading George Carlin's autobiography um, a few years back. It's called Last Words. He wrote it, and it was published after his death. But he talks about being in a tough spot. I can't remember what about, but he, he was having a hard time about something. And he had this, like, really long and deep conversation with, I think, the New York Times reporter. And afterward, he said that they didn't publish a word of it, you know, and they gave him some really good advice, and he was really, really grateful. So I think he, like, named them in the autobiography. It's just interesting to see, you know, that kind of reverse last word, you know, from what like the stereotype would have you expect. But I mean, I, I think we're all just humans at the end of the day. Exactly. Right. Yep. So what have you noticed in terms of like things people might have said before that like, and how do you differentiate like official press from, you know, when you were getting started? Um, like where did, where did that line sort of get drawn and how did it change people's behavior? You know, it's 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 interesting. Um, um, I think that uh, you walk a fine line between I, I, I'm not here to destroy anybody in their no. I'm not here to destroy a company. I'm not here to destroy anybody's reputation, right? And unless they're blatantly being a criminal, uh, you know, that's a different story, that right? That makes a lot of sense. Yeah, but but at the same time. You know, the companies struggle. Um, again, I, I've got enough life experience now and career experience to understand that, uh, you know, your products are going to fail. You're going to have problems with with launching products. You're going to have problems with products running. You're going to have problems with customers, right? All of those things happen, and no one likes to talk about bad news, but, you know, bad news happens, right? It's universal, Mike. I think we've all faced it. Yeah. And so I, I think part of it is, you know, when, when people are going through something struggling, whether that's with their business, right? Um, you know, the question becomes, what about that is uplifting? Where's, where is the positive part of that? Or where's the lesson? And it's, I think, you know, one of the things that I, I also wanted to talk to you briefly about is I sure. think we both have had experience with FIRST and yeah. with, you know, uh, robot, you know, kids robotics. And you read my LinkedIn the, page. Thanks. <laughs> yeah. And one of the things that I always try to teach my robotics students, you know, is to fail quickly and pivot, right? The whole idea. Smart, I think yeah. It's, it's like startup 101. Yeah. As an entrepreneur, that's a hard lesson to learn, but it's something every Your ego has. doesn't want you to, right? I mean, I think that's yeah. that's what you're fighting against is, and, and every startup CEO has a huge ego. I mean, pretty much across the board. And so... I think when when your business plan is going tits up and you, you, don't, you don't really anticipate that, you don't want to admit failure or defeat. At least, I don't think a rookie wants to admit failure or defeat. I think, you know, when you get a little bit older, and I mean, I'm still working on this, obviously, as we all are, but I mean, you've been around no longer than me, so I'm not ashamed to admit that I still have quite a bit to learn. And, you know, I think it's it's not always easy to admit when you screwed up or when you made a bad call or when you misinterpreted the market or you, you thought yep. you saw an opportunity that wasn't really as, as great as it, as you thought it was, or maybe you just reacted poorly to a real opportunity, you know, and, and mm -hmm. that stuff all happens and I've been guilty of it for sure. And I can, will continue to be guilty of it and make mistakes. But I think something that I've gotten better at and that I'll probably continue to get better at is admitting when I screw up and yep. you know, that's, I think that lets you get on with your life faster, like you were saying. And that's a great lesson to be teaching high school kids, by the way. You know, my hat goes off to you for that if I was wearing one. Yeah. <laughs> so, so I think that's when you talk about talking to the press and, and bad press and those kind of things, 
you know, um, sometimes, you know, you're going to have a bad quarter. We know that, right? Everybody knows that you're going to have the occasional bad quarter and you just have to get over it and pivot and move on. Or you're going to have the occasional product fail, flop that uh, doesn't hit the market the way you want it to, right? And you're going to get some bad press, but you got to pivot from that and, and move on and talk about, you know, where you're going next, right? Yeah, and makes sense. Certainly in robotics, there have been plenty of kit companies that failed and, and uh, are gone now and our tombstones in our past and or lessons learned for the rest of us and probably even the people that started them yeah and those people now have have pivoted and moved on to other things right that makes sense so you know i think that's the other part of it is is you know what can you learn and what can you share about those learnings um you know so others I... can learn from mistakes as well I've talked about this before on the podcast, but I actually keep a journal of, of when I make a mistake in business. And so oh. I call it, you know, Spencer's Journal of Mistakes and Lessons Learned. So it's just a <laughs> Google Doc. And I, I every time I screw up in some major way, I, I write about it um, as I'm agonizing and pulling what's left of my hair out. And then I, uh, you know, I, I then have a bulleted list at the top of the journal entries about like, theoretically, if I follow all the bullets in this list, then I won't repeat the mistakes in the journal entries. So there you go. Yeah, I mean it's getting a little bit cumbersome. Like I'm probably up to like 40 bullet points now, which is probably a little <laughs> much. But um, you know, it's it's a helpful tool. Like it's good to reflect on that stuff. And I mean, I always say like I don't mind making a mistake so long as I don't repeat it. You know, and so I think that attitude's important. I did a panel with the Pittsburgh Robotics Network about a year, a little over a year ago. No, it's about a year ago. I don't think it was over a year ago. Um, but it was, I think, the first Pittsburgh Robotics Network event coming out of the pandemic. Um, but it was still virtual. But uh, SK has sponsored this event. I was uh, the host. And then it was someone from Gecko Robotics, someone from Advanced Construction Robotics, and someone from RE Squared. And the theme was, uh, it was called Best Laid Plans, which I didn't love the title, but they didn't want to workshop it. So that's what we got stuck with. But my concept was mistakes and lessons learned um, in field robotics. So I wanted people to tell war stories about a time they screwed up majorly, what they learned from it, and how they've not repeated that mistake in their future work or how it's you know, made future projects go better. But mm -hmm. what I found when I was approaching this panel is that nobody really wanted to admit defeat in a public forum. And mm -hmm. so it was, it was a difficult event to, to kick yeah. off. It was... It went pretty well for a virtual event. Um, we got a decent conversion rate, and um, I reached out to everyone who attended. And about you know, I want to say like ten percent of them, like I'm still friends with, you know, we we ended up grabbing a cocktail or you know, talking shop online or you know, depending on geographically where they were. But you know, in terms of like just percentages on a on a virtual event, it was it was the best that I ever did. I think people really appreciated that honesty. But I mean, yeah. some some companies, in order to be able to do that, they wanted to go back 20 years for the story, <laughs> just to you know, to what's the word I'm looking for? Um, ah, it's escaping me. But like to let themselves off the hook, you know, to be like, well, that was me 20 years ago. I, I mean, it now would never make a mistake in any way. Right. Like I know, I know you make mistakes. What are you talking about? Right. You can't right. say that. <laughs> so, yeah. Could be three companies. You figure it out. <laughs> Yeah, you know, and, and starting a new company isn't easy, and getting a product to market isn't easy, and, and getting a robotic product to market's even harder, right? So yeah, no, completely agree. I mean, hardware is hard. Robots, I mean, the autonomy packages are the people that can do that. Like, I'm not a robotic software guy. I've got nothing but respect for someone that that can actually make sense of all that sensor data, and and turn it into you know a driving algorithm or waypoint navigation or slam or knowing where the hell you are in the world in any way shape or form i mean i, I have tremendous respect for robotic software engineers um, and robotic hardware engineers i mean you're fighting against electromagnetic feedback sensor to noise ratios uh, you've got you know i mean you're fighting against like if you want any kind of decent data you got to spend a million dollars on your well not literally but you you're looking at a very expensive suite of sensors and compute um, if you want to, you know, spend less on your bill of material, now you've got to spend a boatload of money on front-end development of that. So just engineering to be able to 
you know, Tolman and um, filters and, you know, just, mm -hmm. just rules-based engines for when to discard data and mm -hmm. all, all sorts, you know, sometimes, like, if you use a real sense camera, you've got to use a relay to power cycle it if it fails and, you know, the USB connection will fail. And so all of that, I mean, is, it's just, it takes a tremendous amount of work and there's so many different ways for it to go wrong. And we've all seen it. I mean, I told you about the virtual event that we did where we had those little 10 pound robots going through a fake mm -hmm. industrial, you know, James Cameron disaster. And in that, um, you know, we had um, an engineer from DuPont driving one of the robots. And I remember it, it failed when it was in the tunnel feature, which is um, uh, me and my coworkers, like it was like four of us, you know, painting that thing with artists, like in like house paint. And we, we had sand mixed into house paint to make like a, a ghetto bootleg all grip. And um, <laughs> and um, it, it was it was just late nights and, and elbow grease and you know just you know sweat equity money you know all the above. We had an out of work Broadway set designer who was an administrative assistant at the time with us who designed the whole thing, and, mm. and she supplied the specification and the vision, and um, you know we were kind of back and forth with a couple of revs on that, and then it just you know we all banged it out like the the few of us that, you know, were willing to get like a COVID test and meet up in person at that point in history. And so, <laughs> you know, it was, it, it was, it was challenging. And, um, I remember the robot failed in the middle of this thing. It's, it's looking at it now, right? It's like a two and a half foot diameter tunnel. It's, it's a thick quarter inch thick cardboard tube that will bear human weight. Like I, I probably weigh about 200 pounds. And so I can go through that thing and the supports are robust enough. I mean, because Simone had a background in Broadway set design, the entire course is human rated, even though it doesn't have to be. Like, I mean, it's a 10 pound robot. Um, so it's just way overbuilt. And um, when the robot failed inside the thing, I had to take off my suit um, and my Brooks Brothers shirt and shimmy on my back through this sand impregnated, um, you know, uh, <laughs> paint, you know, which just lacerated the crap out of my back. and. Um, I, I, there was, I think, I, dry cleaner must have had to clean blood out of my my dress shirt that week, and um, you know, I, I got to the middle and I grabbed the robot and I, I fished it out and I shimmied back out, and there was a bolt that had shaken loose um, that ended up on uh, Nvidia Jetson Nano that was running the thing and um, oh. shorted out the board. Oh boy! And so yeah, it was a major screw up, and so. Um, you know, always lock tight your fasteners. <laughs> you know I mean? like, yeah. You know, that's, uh, that's the lesson learned. So those are, those are tough lessons to learn, but you, right. Yeah, absolutely. But luckily because the guy was a robotics engineer, um, the, the DuPont dude that was driving it, he's like, Oh dude, I get it. Like, I, I mean, it's a robot. Don't worry about it. <laughs> it's like, if you were a sales representative you would not understand that you know like you know i i'm really really lucky that it was a robotics engineer that had that that misstep you know because otherwise we would have looked like assholes so, yep. yeah but because it was a robotics engineer i mean he probably screwed up earlier that day and so he's like i get it man you know? and something broke on him earlier that day right yeah. i'm sure yeah fair enough screwed up is, is a harsh word but i use it on myself too with affection and I don't mean like it's his fault or it's my fault or, or, or it's anybody's fault. I mean, this is challenging, challenging stuff. You're at the bleeding edge of technology. It doesn't always go right. And if it does, you're probably not pushing hard enough. Yeah. 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 I was going to say, when you talk about pivots, you know, one of one of the my favorite stories to talk about this last year is, is I is we as I look and follow the agricultural market, which we talked about a little bit earlier. Right. I got the chance to go to the World Ag Festival here in California oh, cool. early, earlier this year, which is the biggest farm show on the West Coast. That's awesome. But they had, you know, there are over a dozen robot companies there. And one of them that I stumbled into, and we actually, we actually um, um, honored this company with an RBR50 award this year is a, a little company called Insight Track. I don't know uh, them yet, but I'm interested to hear more. Yeah, and so um, the in the interesting thing about Inside Track is, uh, do, do you know what a, a, an almond mummy is? Almond mummy? No, not yet. 
So the almond trees, the almonds grow inside of a little golf ball sized husk. Cool. And then, and then in the, uh, and then in the harvest time, they shake the trees, all those things fall down. They brush them off the ground, scoop them up and go crack them for all the almond nuts. And that's how they harvest the nuts. And occasionally those things stay on the trees and they shrivel up to like a little prune sized little thing. And it, and then they, uh, um, some moth likes to burrow into that in overwinter there and uh, and then emerges in the springtime and eats all the blossoms. So it's a real pest. And so um, this comp th those are the mummies because yeah, they're, 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 they're growing that the moths. It kind of works on a few levels, right? Because like moths, I feel like are associated with the macabre. And so yeah. that hits and then it's also shriveled up. So it's a mummy in that way. That's that's yeah. interesting. So this company, Insight Track, developed a mobile robot with a vision-guided airsoft gun on it. It's <laughs> awesome. Right? I'd and be lying if I said we hadn't done vision-guided airsoft guns. Yeah, it's, it's, it's for every robotics engineer's uh, favorite uh, project. Yeah. But um, So they developed this, this mobile robot. It rides down the middle of the orchard. It targets all of the mummies and shoots them out off the tree with this airsoft gun. What was the name of the company again? It's called Insight Track. Insight Track. That's really cool. Yeah. And, and the they got CEO, an RBR Top 50. RBR Top 50 this wow. year. That's an the, impressive the, activation. The, the CEO and co-founder is a, a, a woman named Anna uh, Haldevang. She's uh, probably in her late 20s, a um, couple years out of getting her graduate degree in industrial design, right? Cool. And so here's, here's how her great pivot story goes is that she finished school and had this great idea to um, help with pollination of, of fruit trees and wanted to use drones to pollinate the fruit trees. And so she started Wait, interesting. this idea to create a drone based pollinator. Like a drone bee, basically. Yeah. And so she was out talking to all of these uh, orchard owners in California. Almonds, you know, California grows like 80% of the world's almonds. Wow. Yeah. Um, and so they said, you know what, As we know that's going to be a problem if we can't grow bees, but the bigger problem we have right now are these moths. <laughs> we can figure out how to get these mummies out of the tree. We'll buy that. And she goes, okay. And so she sat down and designed this, came up with this idea to shoot these out of the tree. And now, um, you know, they are launching the product, um, you know, this summer in Australia and coming back in the fall to California in it. Looks like they got a really interesting business idea on their hands here. That's awesome. Yeah. So those are the kind of pivots that are just great stories about. You have a great idea. You could go bullheaded straight down that idea and fail. I feel like designers are way better at listening to that product market feedback than engineers are too. <laughs> <laughs> That's it, right? Yeah. Like as engineers, I think we get a little bit masturbatory sometimes, just like wanting to follow like, no, no, but I want to build the thing. You're like, yeah. nobody wants it. <laughs> and she never really built this drone thing. She sort of mocked it up in 3D, printed it, and sort of walked around and said, imagine it flies like this, but it never flew. Yeah. Right? And Which is like, smart oh. because she didn't waste a whole bunch of resources. I don't want to say waste. Like, there might still be fruit there, but... Yeah. I mean, she, she pursued a more viable idea, you know, on the front end, which is highly intelligent, and I have a lot of respect yeah. for anyone that can do that. Oh. I always like to, you know, celebrate young companies that have interesting ideas that, uh, you know, we want to see succeed. Absolutely. Well, and that so. just seems like such a fun one, too. I mean, who doesn't want to build, like you said, you know, a uh, vision-tracking airsoft gun? <laughs> um we looked into it at one point. I think I still have the prototype in a storage unit somewhere. But it was, it was an anti-drone technology. And so the idea oh. was to uh, encumber the rotors with lots and lots of airsoft pellets. So it was four <laughs> airsoft guns mounted on a turret. And then um, we had a PhD in vision that was designing the tracking algorithm for it. But um, just didn't get the, uh, the government money we were hoping for. So I had to pull the plug and go on to the next thing. I think there's actually a college competition, like first, for aerial-based robotic targeting. I'm shooting. happy to give whatever we got to students. <laughs> it's not doing yeah. me any good. <laughs> <laughs> tell me, tell me who, and I'll just donate it and send them the whole box. <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> cool. 
So what else? Like what what other interesting things are you are you seeing these days? I mean, I feel like you've got so much you know good insight on the robotics industry as a whole, and it's just a it's interesting to hear your perspectives on this stuff. You, you know, another th- another thing that caught my interest about a year ago this time was um, a, a comp- talking about competitions because I love competitions. They're fun robotic competitions. Was have you, have you did you uh, follow or hear about the Indie Autonomous Challenge? This year, I did not. Okay, so tell me about this. So the Indie Autonomous Challenge is actually it, it's sort of um, like oh, the a, is this a is this the um, like Joe Fast thing the the really fast yeah, self driving car Joe Speed Joe Speed I told you sorry Joe Joe Speed Joe Go Fast whatever you want to call him yeah yeah so Joe, Joe Accelerated Speed. Velocity <laughs> exactly so the the whole Indie uh, Autonomous Challenge was took place in the, the Indianapolis Motor Speedway last October yeah. And it was a bunch of university teams who got, you know, a given, given they had to pay a little bit for their million dollar race car <laughs> loaded, loaded with, uh, you know, fully autonomous driving, fully sensor packaged um, uh, any race car. Nice. Right. And they I, were using you know, I, uh, Xavier's, right, for that, I think, like AGX. Yeah. Well, and the AD Link, the AD Link was the brains of the whole thing. Uh, that's cool. Right, and you talk about sensor the edge angle, sensor fusion. Right, that was the big, the big, the cars were identical. The sensor package, they didn't want the teams to have to sit and figure out how to design a race car or interesting. The sensor package, so they gave everybody the same exact platform. How many teams just to understand the production scale? Of this? There were um, 10, 10 that's cars. Not nothing. That were, I mean, that's like you said, ten million dollars. I mean. Plus yeah. the NRE to build those in the first place or come up with them. You know, the, the chassis was the same chassis used by the Indy Lights series. Cool. So the chassis is built by Delara, but it was, you know, special a special design with the uh, compute and uh, sensor packages that run it with the LiDAR and the cameras and the G- GNSS. Um, Badass. Uh, packages. And so I got a chance to go out and see the first race in Indianapolis, and it was super exciting. Well, so they got up to – originally they, they they sold it. They would have everybody on the racetrack at the same time, but it was just too hard to get that done. And so they um, they just tried um, – everybody had to try at least make – who could go the fastest in one lap, right? And they got up to, like, uh, the team that won – Got to 130 some odd miles an hour. Wow! And they didn't crash race. the sucker. They didn't crash. Well, there were a couple of crashes. There were a couple, the one of the spectacular um, crashes. The car followed the the wrong um, the wrong uh, track track at the end of the straightaway because there's the other there's the other uh, um, road course at Indianapolis as yeah. opposed to just the oval. And it started following the other course and into a barricade. Out. Yeah, it was going. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, and, one, and one of the other cars crashed because it, it it lost its G, GPS signal. Ah, so, yeah. If you got GNSS that you're relying on for that, that makes a lot of sense. Well, just just think about it, 130 miles an hour. You know, in a, in a millisecond, you've moved about a meter. It's, I forget how, the exact measurements, but and the wall's a couple meters away from you, so. You know, if you so two to five milliseconds will will end you. Yeah, you're done. I mean, and with another car, imagine having now having having you know a pack of cars running together, right? So they only they it doesn't even have to be your fault at that point. It could just be not not fault. Fault's a strong word, but you know what I mean. Like yeah, just somebody, just think about the problem yeah. here. I mean, one is the sensor fusion, right? So you got all of that data coming in. You know, you've got to make decisions about how you, how you fuse all that data, how you know where you are, how you know where you're going, how you know your your vector of what you're doing, and now you have to do it as at the edge of grip, right? So you're pushing the car to the edge of its grip as as and trying to run a race line, which is the fastest race line around the track. So you're not just trying to stay in the center; you're trying to follow the fastest line around the course. Brutal, right? So. Um, you know, and Joe Joe Speed, who was at AD Link at the time, you know, um, and now he's moved on. Um, but the fact is that AD Link learned so much. They've got a whole new platform now, uh, you know, Edge Compute that they brought to market as a result of what they learned. That's such an interesting that. way to to 
move that technology forward. I mean, that's kind of clever. Yeah, like, it's, it's like really a privatized DARPA grand, grand Challenge almost is what it sounds like. Yeah, well, you think about back in the days of DARPA Grand Challenge, they had big vehicles with stacks of laptops in it, right? Data yeah. centers on wheels, right? That were huge and heavy. It's the same things. Everything's been miniaturized. You know, and for example, Joe Speed told me that the problem came down to how fast you could swap memory frames in and out to actually do the compute. So, you know, they broke that down to the, you know, to uh, take away, you know, every time, there, everywhere there was a delay, they, it was all about computing, all that stuff. So that's pushing the edge of it and everybody's going to benefit from that technical technology evolution. And then they did the second race at CES event in Vegas in January this year. I'm sure there was improvement from the first to the second. Oh, they actually had they had the cars had improved in three months enough that they could they had two cars racing each other nice. at a time, and they got up to passing at about 179 miles an hour. Wow, from 130. Yeah, it's orders of mag. I mean, like every yeah. 10 miles an hour, you're able to go at a certain point is is a huge achievement. So, and so now they're going to come back. They haven't said when the next event's going to be, but it, you know it's definitely worth watching. And if you can go see the event live, you know wherever it's going to be, it, it, you know who knows where the next one will yeah, be. Yeah, that sounds like that's worth some travel, I man. Like yeah. that, that's really cool. Thank you for the heads up on that. Yeah. I hadn't tracked that in a while. I met Joe uh, back when I was in the Bay Area doing all those work trips in 2019. Yeah, but interesting dude um i don't know anyone else that's doing anything like that or was doing anything like that at the time or or has since i mean i'm sure there's other folks involved but i mean that's just really really cool I, i'm jealous you got to witness that live it was one of the perks <laughs> maybe i can figure out a way to sneak in if they uh open up the back door or allow the riffraff like me <laughs> cool all right. So I feel like that's probably a good note to end on. I mean, we could we could keep going if you like, but is there anything you want to plug, talk about? I mean, obviously the Robot Report podcast. Yeah, come come check us out over on the Robot Report podcast. Uh, the, the, uh, if you like stuff like this, you'll you'll probably enjoy that too. Um, I, yeah, I would say. So, yeah. We we talk to a lot of the uh, you know leaders in robotics there, and you know who are making things happen. The other big thing that I would pitch is that, uh, you know, we've gotten through Robot uh, Summit. We're going to be doing Robo Business in nice. Santa Clara in October. That's one of my favorite um, publications for a long time. Yeah, so that event's coming back. Um, in, and we're also launching a new event in, in coordination with that called the Field Robotics uh, Engineering Forum. And oh, cool. I'm chairing that, that event. So. I'm really excited about it. We're going to, we're working on the, um, you know, keynote speakers and we'll have a call for presentations here in the next couple of weeks. So nice. anybody field robotics and wants to come out and present, um, look for that event in, in October in Santa Clara. Sweet. Yeah, Mike, this is, this is really cool. Um, we definitely are going to post all that stuff in, in the description. I really appreciate you coming on. This, yeah, is, this has been a pleasure. Invitation. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you.